What's up, y'all? I'm live. Coming on just a few minutes early, give people time to come on. And also because if I come on late, you think I'm not coming. I'm sending a send out, let my people know that I'm here. Okay, you should have got a notification that I was live. Uh, so, just want to let everybody know that I'm here. I'll give people a few minutes to come on. I know some of y'all might still be wondering why I'm broadcasting outside. The answer to that question is because I've had serious internet issues for like over a month now. And I tried to do stuff on my phone and it kept freezing and stuff kept dropping and I was trying to upload videos and things were shutting down. So I've had all kinds of challenges, but the word of the Lord still has to go for it. So I don't have a right to hold back the word of the Lord because of any challenges I might be facing. And I say that to be an encouragement to those of you that are in ministry. So uh, I know that we've long since been in the age of a celebrity preacher. And I know we've long been in a time where it's been about fame and it's been about numbers and it's been about a big platform. It's been about mega churches, it's been about a whole bunch of things. And I know that now sometimes people have uh, maybe an image in their head of wanting to start out on that level or thinking that being on that level is what it's about. But sometimes you got to start where you are. <laughs> and sometimes you got to use what you have. And sometimes you got to do what you can. And let God use you based on that. Okay? And put it in the hands of the Lord and let Him exalt you. Let Him lift you up in due season and according to His time. Okay? So, I just want to give people a chance to come on. Want to uh, uh, give people a chance to come in. When you do come in, please like and share this video. And I know some of you are going to be watching on the replay. Even on the replay, please like and share the video. Because as you hear me say all the time, when the prophetic word of the Lord comes forth, we want as many people as possible to hear it. The reason that I do a live word every week is because we want a fresh prophetic word from the Lord. We want a ring of word from the Lord. We want to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. We want to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So that's why there's a week of live prophetic word, because we don't want to go into another week without having heard from the Lord. Now, you're supposed to have a daily walk with God. You're supposed to have a daily walk, uh, because as what we call the Lord's Prayer, the scripture says, give us this day our daily bread. So you're supposed to have a daily walk with God. You're supposed to go before the Lord every day in the morning before you start your day and surrender your day to him. You're supposed to go every day and ask him to be the Lord of your life. Ask him to take over your life so he can lead you and guide you to all the places you need to go. Oh, there's my sister. Glad to see her. So... So, well, like I said, it's supposed to be give us this day our daily bread. And you're supposed to, like I said, go before the Lord on the daily and get your instructions for life, letting him be the Lord of your life. That's the difference between accepting him as Savior and accepting him as Lord. 
Okay, accepting him as Savior means you're born again, you're saved. You entered into the kingdom of God, you have eternal life. You accepted that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he died on the cross for your sin and rose again the third day, ascended into heaven, sits on the right hand of God. You accepted all that, but you believed it in your heart and you confessed it with your mouth. That's what it means to get saved, to get born again. That's accepting him as Savior. That's literally the easiest part, okay? I didn't say it was always easy, but it's the easiest part. Accepting him as Lord is something you have to practice every day for the rest of your life. You have to learn how to take up your cross and you have to learn how to let go of the controls of your life and let Jesus be the Lord over your life and over all your decisions. And that, I stop by to tell you, does not happen all at once. That's day by day for the rest of your life until you die. And you still ain't gonna get it all right, but at least we can get done. We can't be perfect, but we can finish. Paul said, Ooh, Lord. Paul said he had fought a good fight. He had kept the faith. He finished his course. And he was looking forward to the crown and robe of righteousness that was laid up for him. So we can't be perfect, but we can finish. And that's what you want to do. You want to be sure that you finish what God has given you to do in your lifetime. Okay? All right. So uh, we're going to jump right on in. I was trying to give people a chance to come on. Remember, when you come on, please like and share as many places as you can. All right, we're going to say a word of prayer and jump right in. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for the kind your kindness, oh God. I should fill me with the Holy Ghost. God, I surrender. I lay down my thoughts. I lay down my will, and I must decrease so you can increase. Not my will, but thine be done. Breathe through me, oh God. Have said what you want to be said so you can be glorified in all things, so the saints can be edified, so the demons can be terrified, and so the unbelievers can be challenged to follow you and see that your way is the better way. And I thank you for it. I believe you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Today's live prophetic word is, he brought me out. Today's live prophetic word is, he brought me out. Now, let me tell you something right off the bat, because you know I'm about destroying wrong religious ideas and getting the right biblical ideas in. <clears throat> so let me say this right off the bat. Don't be listening to people that tell you <laughs> that you have to stay in a cycle of suffering. You might go through something for a season, but the scripture says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Remember several weeks ago, I read that scripture where the Lord talked about he would be with you in the deep waters, he'd be with you in the fire, that you're gonna pass through it. Some people I've discovered have made this whole doctrine out of suffering, and they think that constant suffering is some type of uh, mark of piety or humility or something like that, and that's not true. Whatever you're going through is supposed to be just that. You're supposed to go through it but you're not supposed to stay there. And so that's the premise, foundation of what I want to talk about in today's lesson. So our scripture reference for today is Psalm 40, verses one through eight. I'm gonna put that in the chat. Psalm 40, verses one through eight. Now Psalm is right in the middle of the Bible. Psalms is like the third largest book in the Bible. Because the first two largest books are like Isaiah and Jeremiah. So Psalms is like maybe the third. So we're looking at chapter 40, verses one through eight. We're going to read that, then we're going to break it down. I'm reading out of the King James Version, which is actually my favorite version for these scriptures. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he had put a new song in my mouth, even praising to our God. Many shall see it at fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, but such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us with. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast, hast thou opened. Yes. <laughs> uh, Many more can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast not, not required. Then said I, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, did thy laws within my heart. 
Okay, let's look at that. And let's get to what the Holy Ghost wants us to get out of it. Because remember, when you get a prophetic word, it needs to be rooted in the written word, but you have to ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want me to get out of that? How do I apply it into my life? That's how a lot of people miss the point of prophecy, they miss the point of prophetic teaching, they miss the point of scripture reading. Scripture reading is not just to read what God was saying to them. Scripture reading is to understand what the Bible is saying and then how does that apply to me? That's the point, okay? So, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Okay, sometimes, see God has always said that he will deliver us. Sometimes that deliverance comes instantly. Sometimes you have to walk through some stuff. And sometimes that can be a shock to believers. Over and over again in my life and in the lives of other people, I've seen situations where people are shocked that they had to go through. Sometimes things, some, sometimes you have to go through stuff. I wish I was, it was different. You wish it was different, but sometimes you do. So the Bible says you got to wait patiently for the Lord. And then he inclines unto me or he listens to you and he hears my cry. So what does that mean? That means that sometimes, even when you're going through stuff, God is working things out in you. Because I stopped by to tell you, I stopped by to bust your bubble and tell you that some of the trials we go through, we cause them. What did you say, Prophet Taylor? I said, some of the trials we go through in life just come from living in the sin cursed world. Some of the trials we go through in life come from the devil. But some of the trials we go through, we cause them. You need to read the book of Psalms more extensively, and you can hear King David talking about all the times he got himself in trouble and asked God to get him out and asked God to deliver him. Because sometimes, sometimes we have made a series of bad decisions, or sometimes we have operated in ignorance, like we didn't really know what to do, or sometimes we were disobedient and rebellious, or sometimes we got out ahead of the Lord. Sometimes God meant for you to be here but you were so busy trying to get to the next thing, you ran out ahead and the Lord didn't move there yet. Any number of those things will cause you to go through things that you didn't have to go through. And one of the most obvious and one of the most talked about examples in the Bible is of course, Ishmael. Ishmael was the son of Abraham and Hagar. Ishmael was not supposed to exist. God promised Abraham and Sarah that they were gonna have a son, the two of them through their bodies, Abraham and Sarah, but Sarah went through menopause and Sarah got old and Sarah said, well, it's over for me. So why don't you go sleep with my handmaid Hagar and we'll have kids that way. And Abraham said, okay. And he slept with Hagar and they made Ishmael. So Abraham brought Ishmael before the Lord and said, oh, that Ishmael might stand before me. And the Lord said, I'll bless him because he's your son. But in Isaac shall I see be called. So in other words, God said, my promise didn't change. I didn't move. I didn't tell you to sleep with Hagar. You and Sarah cooked that up. And now you got to deal with it. That's also, by the way, what created the, the Palestinian Jewish war because the descendants of Ishmael are the Palestinians. And they've been fighting with Israel ever since Ishmael and Isaac. So sometimes what has happened in life is that it wasn't the devil, it wasn't all the stuff you're blaming it on. Sometimes you jumped out ahead of God. And I mean, it's just human. Jesus is the only person that got it 100% right all the time. And what that means in practical terms is that everything that Father wanted Jesus to do every day, he did it. And he did it without deviating. He did it without variance. He did it without getting off the path he was supposed to be on. He went to the right cities on the right days. He preached the right sermons. He talked to the right people. He went and rested when it was time to rest. He picked the right disciples. He had the right answers for all his enemies. The Lord was on point. Do you know why the Lord was on point? because he did everything that father wanted him to do down to small details every day he lived that's not us sometimes you get in wrong relationships sometimes you marry the wrong person sometimes you are so so determined and so in love at least at first or so in lust or so whatever you're dealing with until you're in such a hurry to get with that person that you just marry him anyway or you let them railroad you into a marriage. I can't tell you, <laughs> I can't tell you how many people that I know that have been railroaded into a marriage. 
they weren't sure or maybe they weren't ready or maybe they didn't have all their questions answered or however you want to say it. But that other person kept applying pressure, applying pressure, applying pressure, and now you marry and you realize that either you got married too soon, you weren't ready, or you realize you got married to the wrong person. See, all that was because you didn't listen to what the Lord was saying. You didn't listen to what the Spirit was saying to the church. You just jumped on out there based on a bunch of other factors. But God expects us to listen to only to him. Um, same thing is true like with investments that the Lord is telling you to put your money certain places and you don't listen when he tells you to move. Or uh, some for some people, they're in the wrong city. Like God told them to move a long time ago and they never moved. Like I have a friend who told me when she was about to move that the Lord told her her husband was in her new city. And I was like, really? And she said, yeah. And she moved out there and they got together. They've been together over 20 years now. I got beautiful children because she moved when the Lord told her to move. You see what I mean? And so that's why I have to tell you, even though sometimes it's really hard to face. Let me say that again. Sometimes it's really hard to face. There's a tendency among Christian circles to blame life. But, you know, we live in a sin curse world. That is true. Or to blame the devil. You know, the devil is busy. That is true. But sometimes the stuff we did, if you want another example from the Bible, uh, that would be Esau. Esau was Isaac's firstborn, and Esau was in line to be part of the, uh, the Hebrew fathers, the patriarchy. And if Esau had kept his birthright like he was supposed to, it, would, it wouldn't have been Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It would have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. That's what Esau was in line for, to actually be named in the name of God, where God would identify himself by the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Jacob actually tricked Esau, but Esau was willing to sell his birthright for a pot of porridge, a pot of stew. And Esau cut himself out of history because he sold that birthright to Jacob. And by the time Esau had realized what he'd done, he went to Isaac and he begged him, please bless me. Please give me the birthright. Don't you have a blessing for me? And Isaac said, no, there's only one. I already gave it to your brother. So no birthright for you. And Esau cut himself out of history because he came out of the wilderness from hunting and he was tired but he didn't care nothing about his birthright. <coughs> Excuse me, so he sold it to Jacob for a pot of stew. We do that sometimes too. Mm -hmm. If you want an example of something like that, something like that is like, <coughs> forgive me, I'm sorry, I'm coughing. Uh, something like that is like virginity. Virginity is a one-time gift. You only got one time to be a virgin. You can only give your first time to one person. You're supposed to give your first time to your spouse. But if you give it away before you get married, you're going to never get it back. You are never going to know what your life could have been if you had only experienced your spouse sexually. Because that's a one-time gift. Once you give it away, you ain't going to never get it back. It's a birthright. And there are plenty of us that have sold our birthright for nothing. See? We've been so busy telling people that God is the God of a million second chances because he is. We've neglected to tell people that God is also a God of one-time gifts. It's not either or. You understand? Like if you want to look at it in nature, in nature, a spider web, a spider web is a one-time gift. Every spider web that's made is unique. And once it's torn, it can never exist again. The spider can spin a new one, but it won't be that one. It's one time. Okay? You want to look uh, at another example of nature, that would be a snowflake. A snowflake is a tiny crystalline work of art. But God carves these intricate crystalline structures in a snowflake, and as soon as it hits your fingertip, it melts. There's never going to be another one like it. One time. It only exists one time. If you want to see something else, it only happened one time. When God became a man, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, when, God, when the Son of God turned himself into a man and walked among us, after coming through the womb of a woman, that only happened one time. That's not once in a lifetime. That's not once in a generation. That's once for all time. There are many manifestations of God throughout the Bible, but there's only one time that God actually put himself in the womb of a woman and came through a birth canal and wrapped himself in human flesh and lived like we do. That happened one time. So if you weren't alive 
to see Jesus when he walked the earth in Jerusalem as a man. All the people that were alive, man, they were some lucky folk. They got to see God in the flesh. That's one time. One time. That only happened one time. Uh, if you were there at the foot of the cross, if you were there when Jesus died, that was one time. One time for all the time, one time for all of eternity. The Lord don't never have to crawl up on the cross again, and he never will. That's one time. So I want you to imagine Peter, James, and John, and Mary, and Mary Magdalene, and Salome, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Simon the Lesser, and all the people that got to put their hands on Jesus and actually touch him. Oh my goodness, touch the risen Savior that one time. You see that? So we've been so busy. Now, God is a God of, of many second chances. Don't misunderstand. We've been so busy selling people that we forgot to tell them. Something's only going to come around in your life one time. I can't tell you the number of people I know and the number of kids that I've worked with that had to go back and get their GED, and they wish they had gotten their degree while they were still in high school. They wish they had just, you know, knuckled on down and finished their diploma when they had the chance. Because you only have one time to be a teenager. You're a teenager from 13 to 19. It ain't but six years out your life. Before you enter them six years, you're itching to get in them. And then they fly by really fast, and then you're going to never be a teenager again. You're never going to have that combination of events in your life again. And there are a lot of people, and nothing wrong with getting your GED, but there are a lot of people that only got their GED because they messed around so much in high school. And they didn't take advantage of the chance that they had to get an education and do extracurricular activities and get good recommendations from the teachers and so many things to give you a lift into the next part of your life. Because you ain't got but one shot to be a teenager. See that? That time in your life, it ain't never coming back. It is literally never coming back. So uh, that's a long way to go. I said all that to say that there are so many times in life what we have done is we have brought things upon ourselves. Sometimes it's not life. Sometimes it's not the devil. It's, it's us. It's you. You made some choices that put you in a place that you didn't have no business in. So King David tells us in Psalm 40 that sometimes we have to wait patiently and sometimes God has to move some stuff around. And sometimes God uses the situations to teach us some things that we didn't know. See, so God didn't cause the situation. That's where a lot of people get confused. God did not cause the situation. Your choices cause the situation. But God is like, since we're here, I'm going to make it a teaching moment. Since we're here, I'm going to I'm going to give you an opportunity to learn and face some things that you didn't learn before. Maybe you didn't have any discipline before. Maybe you didn't have a plan before. Maybe you were around the wrong kind of people before. Maybe you had low self-esteem. Maybe your image of yourself was all wrong. Maybe you didn't heal from your childhood. Maybe you married the wrong person. You got out of the marriage. But God is telling you, before you jump in another marriage, take some time to reflect and learn what you've been through. So God didn't cause a situation, but he'll use it to help teach you some things that you obviously didn't know or else you never would have gotten the situation in the first place. <coughs> so sometimes, that being the case, we have to wait patiently. I know that what we want, it's the same thing everybody wants. You want to just pop your fingers and your whole situation change. I know you want that. Everybody wants that. Everybody wants that. Everybody wants it. Everybody wants because you think that because God has all power that he's a genie. But God don't serve us. We serve him. God don't follow us. We follow him. God don't bow down before us. We bow down before him. And God will sit there and wait and let you make as many mistakes as you need to and let you waste as many days as you need to and let you go your own way as long as you need to until you come to the end of yourself. And then you're going to have to go back to him and surrender. Then you're going to have to go back to him and learn how to say, not my will, but thine be done. Then you're going to have to go back to him and say, I messed up. I got out ahead of you, or I disobeyed you, or I turned out of the path you had me on. Like maybe God has you in a certain place, and you know that eventually you're going to leave that place, but you left too soon. <laughs> the Lord's going to make you go back, go back, do it right. Okay, you see that? So sometimes we got to wait patiently. God will hear you when you cry, but I understand that sometimes you did because of what you did. All right. 
Moving on to the next verses, it says, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. That English word there, a horrible pit, is also translated in the Hebrew, a pit of noise. Good God Almighty. Hasn't 2020 been full of noise? Now, 2020 is, is going to go down in history as one of the most intense and, and incredible years we've ever experienced. But a pit of noise is where it just seemed like there's so much noise. It just seemed like there's so much confusion. It seemed like the devil steady telling you bad stuff. It seemed like you back, got bad thoughts in your head. It seemed like everywhere you turn, it's trouble. You can't tell me 2020 hasn't been like that. That's what it means, a pit of noise. Sometimes, sometimes, if you've ever dealt with controlling people, you know what controlling people do? They're always trying to get in your head to get you off balance so you can't think straight. That's a pit of noise. You always got somebody in your ear telling you you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not smart enough, you can't do this, you can't do that. Nobody will ever love you but me. All the kind of stuff that controlling people do. And that's that's just a pit of noise. They just keep coming at you with all this stuff. Keep trying to tell you that you can't do more than you've already done. That you aren't any more than where you are right now. That's controlling people. Because God's always about expanding potential. Okay? But that's a pit of noise where it's just all these distractions and all this negativity and all this stuff that's not true coming at you all the time. And like King David said, living like that is horrible. So out of a pit of noise, out of a horrible pit, then he says, out of the miry clay. That's a very christian -y phrase, miry clay. You know what that means? It means that you're not on solid ground. It means you're tossing and turning. Every time you put your foot down, you sink one way, then you shift your weight, then you sink the other way, then you sink back, and you can't get any footing because it's not solid ground beneath you. So it's a horrible pit, a pit of noise, a bunch of stuff distracting you, and then you have no solid ground with which to balance and stabilize yourself. So King David says, God is going to bring us out of that. Then he said, set my feet upon a rock and establish my goals. What does that mean in practical terms? I'll tell you what that means in practical terms. First thing it means in practical terms is whenever the Bible refers to a rock, it's always talking about Christ. So in other words, what the Bible is saying in very plain terms is that you learn how to stop listening to all those other voices and listen to Jesus because the Lord is so stable. Not only does he never change, but the Bible says there's no shadow of turning. See how my face is in shadow right now? See how it changes when it changes the light on me? You see that? The Bible says that the Lord is so stable, not only does he not change, he doesn't cast a shadow of turning. That means that God never changes. That means he's stable. He's so stable, he doesn't cast a shadow from turning. So what that means in practical term is that the Lord teaches you how to listen to him and not any other voice. So before you're in that pit of noise and you have all those voices coming at you, but the Lord will set you on a rock. The only way you can be set on a rock is to be set on Christ. So what that means is it, it, it's, a, it's a rough process when you go through it. It's worth it, like every process. But what that literally means is that you have to block out every voice that's not the Lord. That means mama in them. That means nene in them. That means pookie in them. That means the way we used to do things. That means your <coughs> quote unquote, friends there's this lyric that black people have in gospel music talking about my when my all my friends are talking about me. i have never understood that lyric i don't understand how you call them your friends if all they're doing is talking about you i, I never understood that that's a black people lyric. black people gospel music you know my friend all my friends were talking about me really and all my friends talked about really how you call them friends, but anyway, that's just a little side. So the Lord teaches you how to ignore every voice that's not in. That's how we got in trouble. Remember, if you're in trouble of your own making, how did you get there? You get there because you weren't listening to what the Lord was saying. Remember, because you ignored Jesus. Remember, because you just jumped up and did what you wanted to do. He didn't bother to ask the Lord, what was he saying? Remember, so when you're going through that, the Lord's going to take your feet and set them on him, and the Lord's going to teach you that you don't listen to nobody but me. you got to get to that point if you want to succeed. 
you got to get to the point where you don't listen to your own mind, you don't listen to your own flesh, you don't listen to to anybody, you don't listen to any voice but Jesus. That's the way God created us. That's why when God discovered Adam in the garden and Adam said, I was naked, I was afraid to hear myself, what did God say? God said, who told you you were naked? Do you know why God said that? God said that because he was trying to tell Adam, I didn't expect you to listen to any other voice but mine. That's why God said that, okay? So, and the Bible then says that he established my goings. So in other words, God gave you a plan. <laughs> God gave you a plan. God put something, something in front of you for you to strive for. Because if you aim at nothing, you'll hit. So you have to have a plan and God will establish your goings. This is what we're doing. This is what we're going for. Now you have something to work for. See that? Okay. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, but such as turn aside the lies. That's verse four. Verse four just described everything I just said to you. Uh, that you get blessed when you make the Lord your trust, and you don't listen to proud people. Proud people are people that think they don't need the Lord. Let me say that one more time. Proud people are people that think they don't need the Lord, but they can make it on their own. That ain't nothing but human pride. You ain't nothing but clay and breath. The very breath in your lungs is in the hand of God. As in the Kuf taught us that, as in 2020 taught us everything, anything that even the breath in our lungs can be taken away from us. See, we ain't nothing apart from God. We dead. We just clay and breath. We can't do nothing, just like the Lord said. But if you proud, you think, I got this. Yeah, okay, keep living. So it says, respect not the proud, then it says, no such as turn aside to lies. But what that means is just what it says, is that instead of listening to the truth of God, you turn away to something else. You're not going to get blessed up. <clears throat> then it says, many, O Lord, my God, are the wonderful works which thou hast done, and the thoughts which are to us word, that cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be known. Do you understand what that means? God is trying to tell you that I have good things for you. God is trying to tell you that you are on my mind all the time. God is trying to tell you that I think of you so much, you can't count the thoughts. God said you can't count the number of times a day I'm thinking of you. And he has wonderful works. He has good things for you to do. But see, he doesn't force. God does not force his love or his grace on anybody. You have to choose. You have to choose of your own free will. God is not going to have any four servants. Okay, you have to choose. And so God is trying to tell you, I've got all these good thoughts about you. I've got all these good things I want you to do. God is trying to say, I think of you so much. You actually can't count the number of thoughts I have of you. That's how deep on the mind of God you are. So why would you listen to anybody else that don't love you like that? See that? But that's something you have to grow to. That's not something we come here understanding. That's something you have to grow to. And many times it only happens once we've gotten ourselves in trouble and we need to get out. But we have to learn to develop a ear for the Lord because we didn't have it before. Okay? Sacrifice and offering God does not desire. That was verse 5. This is verse 6. Sacrifice and offering God does not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Now, nah, there it is. Just what I just told you. Mine ears hast thou opened. You taught me how to listen to you. See, do you see the common thread through all these verses? <clears throat> Mine ears has thou opened. You taught me how to listen to you. Then he said, verse 7, Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I will delight to do thy will for my God. Yea, thy laws within my heart. That's what God is trying to get you. God is trying to get you to the point where your joy in life is doing his will. And that your law has gotten so deep in his heart that you're driven by his law written in your heart and not by anything else. And when you get to that point, that is truly the path of blessing. And there's no one that's been blessed consistently that doesn't live that way. To where the law of God has penetrated your heart so deeply and so it's your motivator and nothing else. And where the voice of God, you tune that ear so that you have learned not to listen to nobody but the Lord. You don't do anything without praying. You don't do anything without studying the scripture. You don't do anything without trying to get a prophetic word. What the Lord saying, that's the difference. You see that? That's what saves you from marrying the wrong person. That's what saves you from living in the wrong city. That's what saves you from picking the wrong job. That's what saves you from going to the wrong college. That's what saves you from making the wrong investments. 
That's what saves you from missing opportunities. It's what the Lord is saying. Ain't no other voice going to save you. So the good news is, so for me to wrap this up, for me to conclude, the good news is what the Holy Spirit wanted us to know is that God will bring you out. Even if it's your fault that you got there. <laughs> good God Almighty, I'm outside and I might have to shout outside and the folks just have to look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> well, they're already looking at me like I'm crazy. Because the scripture says that God will bring you out even if it's your fault that you got in there. And that is the best news all day. You ain't heard no news better than that all day. That if you got someplace you didn't be, you weren't supposed to be, there was a horrible pit of noise. There was a bunch of distractions and negativity. And it was miry clay. You couldn't get your footing. You couldn't get stable. The promise of Psalm 40 is that God will bring you out even if it's your fault you got in. Good God Almighty, that's the best news all day. Have you heard any news better than that all day? That it might be your fault that you where you are, but you don't have to stay there? Because the good shepherd will come and offer you his hand, but you have to take it. He's not going to force you. He's not going he to offer you his fist. <laughs> He's going to offer you his hand. He's going to do just like that. He's going to open his hand and say, will you let me be Lord of your life? Will you let me lead you? Will you let me? And if your answer is yes, then he will lead you out of that foolishness. But you say, Papa Taylor, you don't understand what foolish is. I mean, it doesn't matter. Is anything too hard for the Lord? But Papa Taylor, I'm old. So what? He gave Abraham and Sarah a baby. Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. So what? So what if you're old? Well, Papa Taylor, it's my fault. So what? <coughs> so what if it's your fault? That's what the blood of Jesus is for. Forgiveness of sin. But Papa Taylor, they're going to talk about me. So what? They ain't going to talk about you anyway. Let me tell you something. I'm going to start saying this a lot. Because this came to me in the last week. And it, it was just such a it was just such a powerful epiphany. I knew I had to start sharing it in my ministry. So you, the, this thing I'm going to say, you're going to hear me say this a lot. But I'm going to say it now. Here it is. I want you to imagine yourself very, 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 very up in age. Like maybe... 97 or 98 okay almost 100 years old i want you to imagine yourself that age and i want you to imagine yourself maybe maybe you know you can't do what you used to or maybe you can or you just need some help or whatever you are but you're 97 98 years of age maybe you have problems going to the bathroom maybe you're sitting on on a bedpan maybe somebody has to help you i want you to imagine yourself in that position and I want you to think about this. None of they are going to be there. <laughs> Woo! None of they, all the people that you refuse to live your true life for and be your true self for. If you live to get really, really up in age, and if you get to a point where you need help physically, none of they are going to be there. I have already seen that happen because I've had relatives in the 90s. I've already seen it happen. I just want I just want you to think about what I just said. I want you to let it sink in your heart because it set me free. I was free, so I'll say it set me free. <laughs> it took me to another level of freedom. You better tell people to get behind me, Satan, because they're going to spend all this energy talking about your marriage. But if you live to be up in years, none of them people are going to be there. And you done messed up your marriage listening to them. All these people are going to talk about your money and what you ought to do with your money. And they think they better than us. And, oh, they think that all, all that different kind of stuff. If you live to be up in years, none of them people, none of them, they, they ain't going to be there when you're 98 years old. Or, or, or sit on the bed if that's how you end up. Because everybody don't end up that way. I've seen people in their hundreds still very active, still walking around, still exercising, still working in the garden. You don't have to end up that way. But I'm just saying, if you live to see many years, I want you to think about what if you have compromised and sacrificed who you are because of the day. Because they told me I wasn't black enough. 
because they told me women don't do stuff like that because they told me that you black people you can't do that because the religious people told you because you were trying to pioneer something because you're trying to do something new that hasn't been seen before but they told you you can't do that if you live to see many years all them they's they're not going to be there and i want you to think about what it's going to feel like to be 98 years old <clears throat> and you never married the person you loved because they talked about you so bad you said forget it maybe you black and you want to marry a white girl but they talked about you so bad you never married what you wanted and now you're miserable maybe you wanted to start a business that nobody's ever heard of and they laughed at you so hard and they talked about you so bad you never started that business and now you're 98 years old probably a safe bet to say you probably don't have 98 more years in front of you probably safe to say that at 98 most of the years are behind you you don't have 98 more years to live but now you never started that business because they talked about you i just want you to let that sink in that none of them people that are trying to stop you from getting to your divine destiny are going to be there if you live to be very very old i just want you to think about that you got let's say you got married really young and you had a lot of kids and the reason you had a lot of kids was because you wanted a big family and i want you to think about how they talked about you you out there you just having a baby every year you just out there just you know just pushing babies out and they, and they talked about you but if you live to see 98 years you're going to be surrounded by your family and they ain't going to be around well they don't let women preachers do stuff like that well they don't let people your age do stuff like that because man you too young 15 and too young start a business or you too old 85 and too old start a business. did you know that colonel sanders kentucky fried chicken do you know he started that business in his 60s <clears throat> do you know when colonel sanders started his business he was walking from county to county maybe even state to state way before there was anything as a kfc like we know it where they actually had, had property and business stands colonel sanders was walking yes he was and people told him he's 60 some years old that's too old to start a business really so that's what i want to leave you as i close leave you with as i close this out i want you to think about all the people go back to your teen years go back to junior high and high school and i want you to remember how they talked about you and there are many things that maybe you did because of peer pressure that you didn't really want to do but they talked about you so bad they talked you into it or maybe there's some things you really have wanted to do with your life but they talked about you so bad that you didn't do it i thought i'd tell you if you live to be 98 years old and you didn't do what you wanted to do you didn't do what god called you to do they not even gonna be around and you done messed up your whole life listen to a bunch of people that didn't care nothing about you trying to stop you from being who god told you to be god might call you to do something that's ahead of its time what do you do when god calls you to do something that's ahead of its time it means that nobody's going to understand you in your lifetime it means God showed you a vision for something that's going to come to pass much later, but he had you set it up in the now so that when it comes to pass later, something would already be in place. All the people that don't have that vision, all the people that don't even understand what I'm talking about, going to talk about you like a dog. Who do they think they are? And they ain't got no business doing that. And, and folks don't do stuff. They don't nobody do nothing like that. Around. And they, and they, and they, and they. Okay, what would have happened if Noah let that stop him? God told Noah to build an ark because it was going to rain until everybody drowned. Nobody believed that except Noah. So Noah got himself and his family, only eight people on the face of the earth believed God and survived. Everybody else laughed at Noah until it started raining. You understand? So don't be one of them people that lived to see many years because I was already free, but I am freer because of this one I'm telling you right here. Don't be one of the people that ends up on the other side of your years and you never went for it.
you know, good and well, God called you to do something and God gave you a vision and it might've looked crazy and it might've been before his time. It might've looked impossible. It might've looked disproportionate for your age. It might've been a whole bunch of things. But remember, I don't remember that her name. Remember that actress that got a Black Panther at the age of 92? You know when she decided she wanted to be an actress? When she was 88. Did you know that? I forget her name, but she's in Black Panther, the first movie. She didn't decide she wanted to be an actress till she was 88 years of age. And before she left here, she got in Black Panther, one of the biggest movies of the year. You see that? Because she didn't let nobody tell her she couldn't do it. She didn't let nobody tell her she's too old. See that? Don't be one of them people that have wasted that. Yeah, I'm not. Folks can talk about me all they want to. I'm going to do what the Lord told me to do. And if it's ahead of his time, it's ahead of his time. That's fine by me. Maybe you just, you just never met anybody like me. You ever think about that? They can talk about me all they want to because I do not want to end up like what I just told you, living to see many years, but you never went for it. Because none of the people that talked about you, that stopped you, are going to be around. They are not going to be there when you're 98. Let that get in your head. So don't fool around and waste your life and not do what God told you to do because of they. Understand? All right. So that's our prophetic word for the day. And remember, the best news you heard all day is that God will bring you out even if it's your fault you got it. <laughs> I'm going to say that one more time because I did it myself. God will bring you out, even if it's your fault you got in. But you're going to have to learn some things. You're going to have to learn how to listen to him. You're going to have to learn how to balance yourself on him and nothing else. You're going to have to learn to block out every voice that's not Jesus and stay in step with him. But God, if you in something right now and it's your fault you got in it, I stopped by to tell you the prophetic word for you is that God will bring you out, even if it was your fault. You just have to learn how to listen and obey. All right? Amen, amen. All right? Uh, that's it. That prophetic word for this week. Don't forget to check out No More Genies that I did Thursday. Oh, don't forget to get on my newsletter list because I offer all kinds of stuff on my newsletter list and all my stuff is together. Uh, there's a button on my Facebook page where you can click and you can get on the newsletter list. So get on the newsletter list so you don't miss any alerts. And I was on here last Thursday did the No More Genies called We Don't Need No More Churches. You need to watch that, okay? I'll be here next Sunday, uh, next Sunday, December 20th, five days before Christmas for the next uh, prophetic word. And then I'll probably take a break. Normally what happens at the end of the year, I have to get together two uh, prophetic locator words. In other words, I have to ask the Lord, what is he saying to us at the end of the year? And then I have to ask the Lord, what is he saying in the new year? So normally right around Christmas, I take about two or three weeks off for my weekly lives. So probably, unless the Lord tells me different, probably next Sunday will be my last weekly live for the year. Then I'm going to drop two locator words, one on December 31st and one on January 1st. So we can close out the new year and get our grace from the Lord and then start the new year with what the Lord is saying. And then I'll start up my weekly lives on Sunday back sometime in January. So that's probably the schedule. Unless the Holy Spirit tells me different, that's probably going to be the schedule for the next couple of weeks. So again, next week live will probably be my last one for the year. And then I'll be working on the locator words. Okay? Now, if you want to bless my ministry financially, I don't do what I do for money. I do what I do because it's what God called me to do. And I love it. Mm. Uh, it took me a while to grow into it, but I wouldn't trade anything for the prophetic. I wouldn't trade anything for being a prophet of God. So if you want to bless my ministry, ministry financially, you want to show into what I'm doing. Uh, I don't use Cash App anymore because, um, because of the fees. I found out that with Zelle, you can just send the money directly and there's no fees. So if you want to bless me financially, you can send an uh, uh, offering to my prophet, David Taylor, gmail.com, or you can send it to my personal email, david.taylor2 at yahoo.com. You want to sow into my ministry and uh, everything you sow into my ministry, I turn it into more ministry, you know, more music, more books, more places I can travel, more places I can go and prophesy and release what God has given me. 
Okay? All right. Amen, amen. God bless you. Thanks so much. And I'll see you next Sunday for probably the last weekly live prophetic word for this year. Amen. God bless. And remember, God's going to bring you out, even if it's your fault that you got in. <laughs> That's good to my soul. Amen and amen.